Hello, my name is Keshwani. That's K E S H W A N I, Keshwani. We are here because we want to prepare for the GMAT. We have been solving GMAT math problems out of this book here GMAT Review, the official guide, the 13th edition. If you do not own this book already, purchase one immediately. You're going to need it. The book contains 230 problem solving questions. It has 174 data sufficiency questions. We already solved every single math problem from this book. If you're interested in watching the original solutions to the problems, you will find the original solutions from day number 1 to 250. Right now, we are in the process of redoing the problems and we are on page number 190. Please turn to it. Page number 190, the very first problem that we see there, problem number 100, or rather the second problem, problem number 197. Problem number 197. In problem number 197, the question is, what is the greatest greatest possible straight line distance in a rectangular box that is 5 by 10 by 10. A rectangular box that is 5 by 10 by 10. Now before I go any further, I want to remind you, I want to point it out to you that uh, I have told you, I have said this thing on many different occasions that I take it for granted that you've been watching these videos in their proper sequence because a lot of the times I cover different concepts in the previous videos and I take it for granted that since we have covered it in the previous video that you already know, you already know, you already know it, you already understand it because obviously we don't have, obviously we do not have the luxury of re keep to, uh, repeating everything, uh, all the things, uh, all the uh, over and over again. That, that, that will be silly. That will take too much time. Anyway, having said all of that, yesterday, and when I say yesterday, I mean day number 55. On day number 55, we did this, uh, we did uh, two problems, as a matter of fact, not one. We did two problems that were very similar to problem number 197 that appears in the book. And my intention at that time actually was to actually do this problem also, but the video became too long and I stopped. And I told you, that after having done those two problems that, you do, that you're supposed to do this problem on your own and then compare your work against the work that you're about to do yourself. If you have not watched yesterday's videos, day number 355, please make sure that you do watch it. 355, stop this video that you're watching right now, 357. Make sure you watch 355. Along with it, I also pointed out that here are these two more videos here. Revised GRE Math, Revised GRE Math, Day 373 and day 374. I know we are not here for GRE, we are here for GMAT. I'm fully cognizant of it. But math is math, you understand? And on those two days, on 373 and day 374, under the tag of revised GRE math, we did, a, we did two problems that are very similar to the problem that we are about to do. It's, it's a good idea to get a little bit more practice because just doing one problem of a certain type is not enough. Anyway, enough of the talk. What we're dealing with here, what we're dealing here is a rectangular box of 5 by 10 by 10. Let's plot the rectangular box and I'm not going to go into all the details. I'm not going to explain everything that the concept behind it. I'm just going to take it for granted that you understand it because you watch day 355. Here's the box that we're dealing with, a 10 by 10 by 5. Let's plot it here, 10 by 10 by 5. And if it doesn't come out very nice, I may have to erase it. There we go. That's our box here. Let's call it 10 by 10 by 5. Let's not call it 10 by 10 by 5. That's exactly what the bloody thing is supposed to be. 10 by 10 by 5. And what we're looking for is the greatest possible distance. And the greatest possible distance that is going to be, as we explained on, on, on previous day, is going to be the two opposite, di two, uh, two opposite verses right here. This is the longest possible distance we can find. Let's call them Let's call them P to Q. Let's call this point P and this point Q. But before we can find that distance, we have to first find out 
this distance right here, which is what we call on day number 355, we refer to this distance as the floor diagonal. Let's call this, so we have P, Q, let's call this thing R, P, Q, R, let's call this point S, and let's call this thing T. So our floor is, our floor of the box is R, S, T, oh, sorry, rather Q, R, S, T. And we're looking for the floor diagonal first. We have to know the floor diagonal. We have to know the floor diagonal S to Q because we're going to use this triangle here, the triangle S, Q, P, and we're looking for the distance P to Q. Triangle S, P, Q is a right angle triangle. This is, this is not a complicated problem, it's a very simple problem. What gives people difficulty is the fact that we're dealing with a three-dimensional three object here, three-dimensional rectangular box, but all that is required here is simple application of Pythagorean theorem twice. First, we're going to use Pythagorean theorem to find out this floor diagonal from S to Q. Once we have the floor diagonal, we're going to use that value, and we're going to again apply Pythagorean theorem on the right angle triangle that we see here, which is S, P, Q. Let's find out the floor diagonal S to Q. S to Q. So here's our floor. Here's our floor, which is R, right here, R, S, right here, S, T, and Q. And in that floor, this, this thing is 10. This distance from R to S is same as this guy, which is 5. R to S is 5. And what we're looking for is the floor diagonal. Well, in the picture I showed you, the, I showed you this diagonal, and here I applied it. That one, it really doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter. So this diagonal, let's call it X here. X squared is going to be 10 squared. 10 squared plus 5 squared is going to be 125. And therefore, the floor diagonal is square root of 125. That's the floor diagonal. Leave it alone. And now we're going to use this value of x square root of 125 on the triangle SPQ. On the triangle SPQ. Just give me one brief second. I'm going to have to erase all of this work. I'm going to have to erase all of this work because we need the room. Unless we can squeeze it right here. S to Q, S to Q, and here, there is the P. S to Q is the floor diagonal, we just found out it is square root of 125. P to Q is what we're trying to figure out, that's what we're into, let's call it Y, that's what we're interested in, distance P to Q. P to S is the same distance as this distance which is 10, P to S is 10, P to S is 10. So that's it. Again, one more simple application of Pythagorean theorem will do the job. Or can we do it? Let's do it in the top. Let's do it on the top. So we're using this triangle here. In triangle SPQ, SPQ, the diagonal is what we're looking at, which is what we're calling Y. Y squared is going to be 10 squared plus the square root of 125 is squared. 10 squared is just 100, and square, square of square root of 125 is just 125. We end up with 225, that is our y squared, and therefore y, this implies that y is simply 15. Because we know that 225 is a perfect square, 15 times 15 is 225, therefore the y is 15. That's it, that's your answer. The answer is 15. The answer is A. Answer to this problem is A. But if there is anything that you, that give you trouble and that you felt that I did not explain it uh, properly or in depth, well, I did explain it. I assure you, properly and in depth, on 355. Let's go to the next one. Number 100 and 98. Number 198. In number 198, 
we are told that we have newspaper we have newspaper A that we are selling for one dollar each we have newspaper B that we are selling for dollar twenty-five each we are told we are told that R percent of revenue was from was from the sale of A R percent of our total revenue was generated from the sale of newspaper A by the way newspaper A and newspaper B is all we are selling do you understand? We are also told that P percent of all the newspaper were A. P percent of all the newspaper were A. The question simply is express express R in terms of in terms of P. That's all it is. As you can clearly see, as you can clearly see. It's an algebra problem. It's an algebra problem. You have come across algebra problem many, uh, many a times, on many occasions. And on every single occasion, I pointed out to you that because it's an algebra problem, because it happens to be an algebra problem, which is why we're going to do it without the algebra. When you come across an algebraic problem in the exam, you have two choices. There are two different routes you can take. One is to solve this algebraic problem into, uh, in, in the manner uh, that they expect you to solve, which is the classical way, the orthodox way, the traditional way, the, the traditional way, the orthodox way, the classical way, the conventional way, the academic way, the geeky way, the nerdy way, the algebraic way. Another method, another option that we have at our disposal is to convert this bloody thing, this bloody algebraic problem into a simple arithmetic problem. Convert it into a very simple arithmetic problem. And how do we do that? by replacing all the variables with numbers. Just plug in different values for the numbers. Numbers that, that are friendly, numbers that are easy to work with. That's what we're going to do. We're not going to solve it in an algebraic way. That will be a sheer waste of time in the real exam. Let's plug in numbers. Let's pretend, let's pretend that we sold a total of 100 newspaper. Let's pretend, let's pretend we sold a total of 100 newspaper. Okay, that's the first part. Why 100? Because it's easy to deal with. We're dealing with percentages here. Because they go on to say that P percent of all the newspaper were A. Let's make up a number for A. And don't, in a situation like this, it's not a good idea to plug in 50 for P. You understand? You want you want something creative. Because 50, uh, then, you, uh, then you lose the distinction between the numbers that were sold, number of newspaper that were sold uh, for newspaper A, and the number of newspaper B that were sold. You lose the distinction completely if you plug in 50 for P. We want to make a point here that different quantities were sold. That's the whole bloody point here. Let's plug in 60. Let's plug in 60 for P. Are you with me? Let's begin our work. Let's begin our work. So, we sold 60 of them. 60A for one dollar each. Well that's sixty dollars. Well that was easy. If we sold sixty of A, we must have sold forty of B for dollar twenty-five each. For dollar twenty-five each. For well, forty, forty times one is forty, and then forty quarters. If I have forty quarters, that's ten dollars. So that's fifty dollars. That's fifty dollars. That was sixty dollars. So it turns out, it turns out that we have generated a total revenue of one hundred and ten dollars from the sale of these two newspapers. Let's carry on then. We were told that the R percent of the revenue, R percent of the revenue was from A. R percent was from A. Well, the revenue, revenue from A, revenue from A 
which we are told is R percent, as you can see, we generated $60, $60 out of a total of 100. But they want it in percentage, so we have to multiply this by 100. This is our answer. This is our final answer, and we refer to this. We refer to this as our punchline. This is our punchline. Now all we have to do at this point, all we have to do is go, all, go through all the answer choices, go through all the answer choices that we have there, one by one, and whatever we see P, whatever we see P, oh, let's, put, let's do it a different color for, for the flair of the dramatics, whatever we see P, replace it with 60. Replace it with 60 until when? Until the cows come home? No, not until the cows come home, until we get upon something that gives us our punchline. Until we come upon an answer choice that works out to be 60 times 100 over 110. Let's begin our process, shall we? Let's begin our process. We're going to erase this problem now. I'm going to get out of your way for a second here so that you have unobstructed view and then we'll begin the process. We'll go through all the five answer choices one by one. Answer choice A says, and of course in the real exam we do not go at such a leisurely pace. So you just look at the bloody thing and you can tell that it's not working out. For example, A says, for example, A says 100 times P, remember P is 60, 100 times P, well that's the good news, 100 times 60, that's exactly what we need, 60 times 100 is exactly what we need, that's actually a very good sign, if the bottom works out fine, then we are home free, if we get 110 in the bottom, we are home free, answer is A, on the bottom they have 125 times 60, 125 times 60 is not 110, if 125 times 60 is not going to give us 110, the answer is not A. Let's look at B. B says 150 times P, but that's not actually a good sign. We don't need 150, we need 100. But let's carry on anyway. Perhaps we can reduce it and make it 100. You never know. And in the bottom we have 250 times 60. No, no, we got a problem here. We got a big time problem here. 250 times 60 is 190. There is nothing we could do with 190 and 150 in terms of reducing it. So on the bottom we have 190, we need 110. On the top we need 100 times 60, we have 150 times 60. Answer is not B. Let's look at C. Answer to IC says, answer to IC says, 300 times P. Oh, lastly, 300 times 60. 300 times 60. The only way we're going to convert the only way we're going to get 100 out of 300, we need 100 there, only way we're going to get 100 out of 300 is if we can divide the top and bottom by 3. Let's see what they give us. In, the, in other words, the bottom has to be some multiple of 3. And on the bottom we end up with uh, 375 minus P minus, minus 60. Again, as I said in the real exam, I wouldn't do all of this thing. You just look at it. You just look at the bloody thing and you realize the 375 times 60 is 310. There is not much we can do with 310 and 300. On the bottom we need 110. Okay, listen carefully. Listen very carefully. Listen very carefully and see if you understand it. Well, I don't mean it that way, but listen carefully. 110 is what we need at the bottom. But we also have to convert this 300 into 100. The only way we can convert this 300 into 100 is to divide the top and bottom by 3. In order for us to get to be able to divide top and bottom by 3 and end up with 110 is when the bottom happens to be 330. And this is not 330. This is clearly not 330. The answer is not C. Let's look at answer choice D. Where can we look at answer choice D? Answer choice D says. Answer choice D says, let's need more room. As you can see, I'm being very subtle as to why I'm making so much room for D. That is my middle name. That is subtle, that is. 500 minus 60. 500 minus 60. Look, this is a good sign. I'm going to tell you why it's a good sign. Because 500 minus 60 is 440. And we know 440 can be divided by 4 very easily. Because we need, we need to convert this 400 into 100 because we need 100 on the top. So that 400, the only way we can convert this to 400 into 100 is if top, if we can divide top and bottom by 4. And that being 440 actually is a very good sign. So 
we can end up with 400 times 60 over 440. And what do you suppose is going to happen if we divide top and bottom by 4? Well, if we divide top and bottom by 4, this is going to become 110, which is exactly what we need here. We needed 110 at the bottom. And the top, if you divide by 4, is going to become 100. Voila, 100 times 60 times 110. You can do you can do you can do out answer choice E yourself. E is not going to work. The answer is D. Let's go to the next one, shall we? Let's finish up this column number 199. Let's finish it up before I close the video. I was going to I was going to stop right now, but why do it right now? It'll be awkward. Let's do one more number 199 so that we can finish the column. Okay. Just give me a break as usual. But that's what it was. You have to convert this into an arithmetic problem, otherwise you will make your life very miserable if you insist, if you're hell-bent on doing it like a good schoolgirl or, or a good schoolboy, algebraic way that is. That's a waste of time. To say nothing of the fact, to say nothing of the fact that if you go the algebraic way, you're more likely to make mistakes. And if you end up making one of the four most popular mistakes, then your answer choice that you arrive at, doing the classical way, if you end up making one of the four, four popular mistakes, then the answer choice that you arrive at is going to be one of the answer choices there. And you'll be very happy because your answer choice matches with that answer choice, and you'll never know that you got it wrong. If you plug in numbers, not only it takes less time, but you and not only you're less likely to make mistakes, but even if you do miss mistake, there is no trap there in the in, in, in the plugging link because they have no way of knowing what you're going to plug in ahead of time. How can they set up the traps? Do you understand? Number one hundred and ninety-nine. Point and count them properly. I counted them properly, and there are eight of them. It's very important that you pay attention. Eight of them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. I did this on purpose so that it's easy to see with the eyes that there are eight of them. I left room in between like that, even though it's silly, I know. Over 1.0001 minus, again, eight of them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. Over. 1.003. Now listen to what I have to say for a second. It's not going to sound very good. It's not going to sound very good, but that's just the way it is. As the Frenchies would tell you, c'est la vie. You understand? That's just how the cookie crumbles, as the Americans say. There are some instances where you're going to have to realize, or you're going to have to say to yourself, this is not the battle I want to take on. This is, this is something I want to walk away from. You're not going to win, you're not going to win all of them. This is the kind of problem where if something clicks in your mind, if you see what's going on right away, you're home free, you're all set. But if nothing clicks, if nothing clicks, you can sp end up spending an inordinate amount of time trying to work this problem, particularly if you insist on solving the bloody thing by sheer brute force. By sheer brute force, I mean actually doing it all out, that'll be damn silly thing. You understand? As I said, if you do not see the quick way, there is a strategy here. There is a strategy here. There is a method here that they want you to see. You will either see it right away or you won't. If you don't see it, close your eyes, pick an answer choice, just move on. Do you understand? That's what it is. As I said, otherwise you will end up spending an inordinate amount of time on the problem. Again, as always, it's not a very complicated word, but I'm curious as to, yes, we did learn it on day number 72. Vocabulary, day 72. Of course we learned these words because these words that I covered in my vocabulary videos are the words that I use typically in my lectures. That's what it is. And therefore I covered them in the video so that it's easier for the clients to, to, to stay with me. Let's do it. Like I said, you will either see it or you don't see it. What's going on here is this. 0.9999999 can be written as, this can be written as, 1 minus 0.000001 over 1.001. That was the easy part. Similarly, I shouldn't have taken so much room. I did it again one more time. Similarly, this can be written as 
1 minus point zero 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 nine because it's the 1. So when you subtract it becomes 9 over 1.003. Are you with me? Now this quantity that you see here, this quantity 0 0.0000.0000001 000 000 and the quantity that you see on the top 1.001 .001. by the way 1.001 .001 can be written as 1 plus 0 0.001 I'm giving you a hint. Similarly this can be written as 1 plus 0 0.003 that was your hint. Are you able to make any connection between these two numbers? 0 0.000001 000 and 001? Are you able to make any connection? If you have 0 0.001 and if you multiply it by 0 0.001, or well 1 times 1 is 1 times 1 is just 1, and we have Something is wrong. This, this, not, this is not enough. I just realized this is not enough. I'll tell you why I realized it's not enough. Because if you multiply 0 0.001 times 0 0.001, you're going to have six decimal places. 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, that's 6. We have a 9 here. I must have written it wrong. I must have made a boo-boo in, in both of these places. Let me just make sure that I did not make, I did make a mistake. The bottom is not right. The bottom is not working out. The bottom is not working out the way we want it to be. It should be 0 0.00. 0, 1. And this should have been point zero 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 three. So we need one more zero. We need one more zero. And I'm, gonna, I'm not going to do a red pen. Now if you multiply these two numbers together, we have one, two, three, four decimal places. And here we have one, two, three, four decimal places from here. So when we multiply it, we have our one. The decimal will appear we need to move that decimal is right here. If the decimal is right here. 1.0 is what it is. We have to move this decimal eight places. Eight places. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. It ends up here. It ends up here. So how many zeros does it take? It takes one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Are you able to see that point, point zero zero 0.001 squared is this quantity right here? Is this quantity right here? Are you able to see it now? That's what we're going to do. That's what we're going to do. Let's, let's do it here. I need the room. So this can be written as 1 squared, because this is just 1 squared, minus 0 0.0001 squared. And on the bottom we have 1 plus 0 0.0001. Similarly here we have minus 1 minus 0 0.0003 squared, 1 squared, over 1 plus 0 0.0003. Same exact thing. If you multiply, if you multiply point zero 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 three by zero 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 three, you're gonna end up with nine, and we're gonna have to move one two three four decimal places here. One two three four decimal places there. We have to move eight decimal places, and when you move this decimal eight places, one two three four five six seven eight. The decimal is right here, and we need seven zeros. One two three four five six seven. Just like here you see here, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7 zeros. So this quantity that we see here, 0 0.0000009, is same as 0 0.0003 squared. That's it, we're done. The hard work is already done. Now, the next thing we have to understand is that 1, a squ this 1 squared minus this quantity, what we're looking at is this, a squared minus b squared over... A plus B. A squared minus B squared over A plus B is simply A minus B times A plus B. I don't know why I'm showing you all the baby steps. 
a, a plus b cancels out, and what we're left with is a minus b. Our a is 1, this is our a, and our b is this quantity. So what we end up is simply is a minus b. What we end up here is a minus b. Let's do it here. What we end up is a minus b, so it's simply 1 minus 0 0.001 on this, from this part right here, and here we have minus 1 minus 0 0.001. That's all. 1 minus point zero zero 0.001, 1 minus point zero zero 0.001 is simply going to be point, point 0.999. There should be one more zero here, sorry. There should be one more zero here. And it should be 9999 minus point nine 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 but now it's not going to be, be taking away three so it's going to be seven let's continue this from the top let's continue this from the top so point nine 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 minus point nine 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 seven is going to give us point zero 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 two if you multiply top and bottom by 10 raised to 4, multiply the top and bottom by 10 raised to 4. If you multiply this quantity by... If you multiply the top and bottom of this quantity by 10 raised to 4, essentially we are multiplying it by 1, but 0 0.0002 times 10 raised to 4, allows us to move the decimal place. The decimal is right here. 10 raised to 4 will allow, will allow us to move it 4 places. 1, 2, 3, and 4. It becomes 2. So it's 2 on the top over 10 raised to 4, which can be written as 2 times 10 raised to negative 4. I did give you a warning. I did, I did warn you. I did, I did share the caveat with you that this is not for everybody. This question came with a caveat that this is not meant for everybody. You either see it or you don't. There's a lot going on here, but it's actually not that bad if you, if you can actually see it and if everything clicks in the right places. Do you understand? Did we learn the word caveat? Caveat, the word caveat, some people pronounce it as caveat, as I just did. Some people pronounce it as caveat, which is, which is perfectly fine. Both of these are considered correct pronunciation. Did we learn the word caveat or caveat, if you like? Yes, we did. On day number 63. Day 63. Uh, again, as always, just type in GMAT vocabulary words. Day 63 and improve your vocabulary. It's very important to have a good command of the English language. You understand? And having a good command of any language requires having decent vocabulary, obviously. Not just for the exam, for life in general. Anyway, I'll see you tomorrow, okay? I know.